Hi everyone, thank you so much for your attention today. My name is Becky Desjardins, I work at Naturalis Museum. I'm gonna be talking about how to design exhibits with an eye for their upkeep. Back in 2019, Naturalis opened a brand new building and as the person who's in charge of keeping all the collection material on exhibit clean and well cared for, I have definitely picked up a few tips that I'm looking forward to sharing with you today. The talk will roughly be in two parts. The first part I'm going to talk about things you should consider when designing a new exhibit. And secondly, I'm going to talk about how to take care of the beautiful building that you just, or the beautiful exhibit that you just opened. The first thing to think about is airflow. There are lots of rules in the Netherlands, and I'm sure other countries as well, about the airflow in a given room, how much it should be, how many, it's based on the size and how many people are in that room. It's not gonna be like wind blowing through the room, that's not the issue. But what I've noticed is that during um, the areas or in the areas where the air is coming out, they tend to be dustier than other parts of the room. So I would say if you can, don't put something that's really challenging, challenging to clean, such as butterflies or a giant bird's nest right next to an airflow output. The second thing to think about are what are your surfaces going to be? What are the plinths made out of? What are the platforms made out of? Um, good surfaces are things that are easy to wipe off. So think about treated or painted wood, MDF, glass, tiles, as long as the grout isn't too challenging. Things that are not so great to work with are unfinished wood of any kind. It tends to be really sticky and just grab the dust. Uh, cement, even if it's treated, Dust, it just gets really dusty and you just have to yeah, take time wiping it down. And also oil-based paint. We used oil-based black paint in one of our halls and it looks amazing. The specimens just like really stand out. They look so nice, but it is best cleaned with a damp cloth. And that is a lot of effort to carry a bucket of water around. And also you can't get a damp cloth near taxidermy. So um, when you're looking at paint, just think about, ask how easy it is to care for and um, can you do it dry, basically. You want to have really good work lights so that you're working really safely. Most of our halls don't have windows in it because, you know, we don't want that natural light getting on our specimens. So you want to make sure they're nice and bright so you can work safely, especially if you're on a ladder. You want to have a lot of electrical outlets in there because maybe you're using a vacuum cleaner that plugs in or not. Is there a soundscape? Can you turn it off? If you turn the soundscape off, will it affect the soundscape in other rooms? Because you don't want the situation where you're working in one room and you have to leave the soundscape on because if you turn it off, it turns it off everywhere. And then, you know, you're listening to like monkeys chatter for eight hours, which can be, you know, a little intense. Uh, I always joke that my favorite color is dust gray, and that's because it really hides the dirt in exhibits. And I don't think you should not paint your exhibits dark colors, because of course they're really spectacular and they look so nice, but just keep in mind that dust goes everywhere and you'll see it everywhere on the plinth, on the wall, on the platform, and it's just going to take a little bit more time to clean it up, or maybe you have to clean it more often so that um, you know so the visitors don't see it. Dust traps. We have a couple of vitrines that are really challenging. The one on the right is open and we call it the birthday cake. It's round. It's so cool looking, but it's open and as a result, it is a dust funnel and the dust just really goes directly in there. And then the one on the left is an open vitrine. You can kind of see the seam on the side. I don't know how the physics of this works, but the dust just goes right in there. It's such a small crack. How can so much dust get in there? So. My recommendation is to seal your vitrines. We also use this metal shelving in one of our halls and it looks so nice and it's really light and airy and it's, but it holds a lot of weight. It looks really good, but it has these supports. You can see with the yellow arrow there um, and they're shaped like V's. And so dust just gets stuck in there. And so when you're thinking about exhibit design, think about the fact that the dust is basically going from high to low, so it's kind of sinking down. Think about places where it's going to collect. Cleaning these divots with a vacuum cleaner is not a big deal at eye level, but when you're up at four meters, five meters, seven meters, and you're in a lift, it's just an extra challenge. Um, and 
if I were to go back in time, I would see, can we like flip these over? Because a V shape can really hold a lot of dust and you don't want to end up with pest problems. Hard to get into areas. You will have these. <laughs> it's just the way museums are. You'll have that really nice diorama or that really cute corner. And then at some point you'll need to clean it. It's no big deal. You just really want to make sure that somebody knows how to get in there. So at Naturalis, we actually have one copy of our um, you know, draft design of the building itself where somebody annotated how to get into all these corner, all these small corner areas. So, you know, you go behind this piece of furniture and you open up this wall, look out for the cord, and then and then you can get in there and clean it. So it's not a problem. You just need to have a plan. Vitrines, even if you think we will never have to open it. One day you will have to open it. Maybe a researcher wants to look in the material or maybe finally after a couple of years, there is dust in there. So just in the back of your mind or maybe on paper, think about how to open it and who can open it. Is it small enough that you can open it yourself? Can you open it with your technical team or do you need to hire professionals to do it? And if you need professionals, just think, okay, we need to set aside a certain amount of money because we, I suspect every other year we'll want to open it and this is how much it costs to open it. All right, now we're getting into part two. You have a beautiful exhibit, now what? You need to make a plan for upkeep. You need to think about who is cleaning and what objects are they cleaning? When are you cleaning? How often does it need to be done? Can the hall stay open while you're cleaning? How to clean it? Do you need a vacuum cleaner? Do you need some Swiffers? That kind of thing. And who is going to pay for this, whether it's with their time or their budget? These are all things to think about. So who's going to do the cleaning? At Naturalis Now, we made the choice that, or the decision, that basically all the material on exhibit is considered to be collections material. Therefore, it is cleaned by collection staff. However, before this new building, we outsourced it to, um, you know, a contractor who came and did the cleaning. And then uh, in the old build, the old museum where I used to work, the exhibit staff did it because it was considered to be exhibit material. So you just want to think about who's going to do this. And it varies from museum to museum. Uh, there's no wrong way. You just need to, you know, it helps make a plan in advance before it's dusty. And then you're like, who's going to be cleaning this? In our collections department, the managers gave permission for everybody in the department to be able to take some time to help me clean. So I made a roster and I shared it with everybody. And you can see on the left is the date of the cleaning. Uh, on the center is the time because, of course, some halls take more time to clean than others. So some we can do before or after the museum is closed. Some we need to we need a whole day or a half day and then the name of the hall and then how many people I need to help because sometimes it's big. I might need five people. Sometimes it's small. I might need two people. And of course, those of you who are closed on Mondays, you have it much easier because you can you have a day when you're closed and you can do all these cleaning. But for us, it's a little bit more kind of a catch as catch can. But this is the roster. And again, the managers uh, gave thumbs up for everybody to take time to help me. But it's not required. So people who are really busy don't have to do it. How often do you need to clean um, after school holidays? Uh, I guess uh, when I started out, I started out cleaning every hall twice a year. And then in about two years, it became really apparent to me which ones needed it more. So some of our busier halls, they just get dustier. People create dust. There's dust always coming off of our clothes and our hair. So after school, we have our busiest halls need to be cleaned after school holidays. Um, you, of course, don't want to be cleaning during a really busy period because you don't want to have to close a hall. Um, and this is a great video after Christmas, <laughs> I think, of David cleaning a super dusty elephant. And that's Melvin on the front there working on the trunk. Who should be involved when you're making decisions about cleaning? You need to actually involve a lot of different people at the museum. You need to involve the normal museum cleaning staff, the people who do the floors, because when you clean or when I, when I clean, I'm creating a lot more dust and then the next day it's gonna take more effort for them to clean it up. You also don't wanna do a big cleaning of specimens the day before the museum cleaners have a big inspection. I'm speaking from experience here. It's not very nice to do that. 
You also want to involve your technical team because chances are they're above in the lights every now and then and they need to change filters or lamps or projectors or whatever. They're making dust kitties from above, which falls on your specimens. You want to make sure you're cleaning after that happens and not before. And of course, you need to involve the front of house staff because they can let you know, you know, don't clean on this day because we have a school group coming. And so basically what we have done at Naturalis, we have a big, we had a big meeting where all these people from all these departments were there. And then it was actually the woman who's in charge of the front of house. She made the agenda. She was able to look at the roster. She knows what days are busy, what days, you know, things are scheduled. And she basically broke it out. So for some halls, the first day is the technical team. The second day is me, that kind of thing. For some of the busier halls, that how, that's how it works. But basically involve more people than you think you need to be involved because that way everybody's happy that they get some to say something and have their input heard. Quiz. It's on exhibit, but it's not collection material. Who cleans it? This might be less of a problem for, for smaller museums, but because we have a big cleaning staff, it's like who cleans collection material and who cleans not collection material in which, muse in which you know, who does it? So basically I clean collection material, which in this case is just the crane, but the Japanese house, the cherry tree, and the van are not collection material. But who's going to clean them? In our case, it's done by the regular cleaners, but maybe it's one of those things where they're like, well, Becky, you're already up there on a ladder. Why don't you just run around with a vacuum and clean the roof of the house as well or whatever? So these are also things that, uh, to think about um, and ask your technical team and your cleaners who wants to take care of this kind of stuff. All right, tools of the trade. What I use, I love a Swiffer. I love the Swiffers that come in the yellow box. Here they're called Swiffer Dusters. They are amazing. I also use Feather Dusters. That's what you see in this picture, also known as Plumos. These work really well for about, I don't know, not that long, maybe six months, maybe a year. Once they stop grabbing and trapping the dust, then we have to throw them out and get new ones, which, but happily they're not very um, expensive, which is nice. I have a couple of vacuum cleaners. I use Makita brand. I have a backpack one and I also have a handheld one. They're both rechargeable. Um, we use filters. They work quite well. I do not vacuum specimens. I vacuum around specimens. I use the Swiffers or the Plumos on the specimens themselves. I always make staff wear dusk masks. Um, and that's because, yeah, you don't want to breathe all the dust that you're kicking up. We need to wear shoe covers because some of our exhibits, the one I mentioned earlier with the black paint, it scratches really easily, so you don't want to accidentally damage the paint. Um, also, you might need a lift or uh, like a personnel lift or a ladder. And if you need to have training to use these things, you need to make sure somebody has training. Um, I don't worry too much about, I mean, we use filters and everybody's wearing a dust mask, but most of our specimens are not so old that they are arsenic-y. So, um, so that's sort of less of an issue. And also in the photos I've been showing you in these slides, some of them are older photos than others. I used to require people to wear lab coats, but I don't anymore because it just inhibits your movement. It's really not necessary. I just let people know your clothes might be dusty after today's work and you'll want to wash them. And of course, we can wash them for people if they would rather have us do that. How to clean here. You can see y'all's hard at work <laughs> with the Swiffer. It's just like cleaning at home. You start high and you work your way down. When you're cleaning a specimen, you start at the head and you work your way down to the tail of the animal. And then we clean the surface around where the animal is. And when you clean that surface, sometimes we use a Swiffer, sometimes we use a vacuum. It sort of depends where it is and how busy it is. Um, and that's kind of how we do it. This might sound really simple, but take a photo before you empty the vitrines. I was just informed that I, last week when I was cleaning a vitrine, I basically put back the ostrich egg label on the kiwi egg, and now I have to open the vitrine and fix it. Cleaning takes time and it takes bribes, but it's also kind of a fun moment. So um, because people are sort of volunteering their time to help me, uh, I always try to have treats, either homemade or ones I've bought. We always take a coffee break together because a lot of times these are people who might not work with me on a day-to-day -day basis. And in general, people are pretty happy to do it. If you are allowed to have front of the house staff help you 
they really like it because they're the ones who are in those exhibits every day and they see how dusty it is and they see where the dusty parts are maybe more than you do. Um, so yeah, I just try to make it really friendly and, uh, you know, have a nice time. Put up some music. It's really good for social media. Now when I'm cleaning out, I always let our marketing team know because everybody loves to see you, you know, dusting a dinosaur with a feather duster. It's so hilarious and cute. And usually the people who are doing the cleaning, they are also excited to put this stuff on their social media page as well. So definitely run with this, call your marketing people. And with that, my talk is done and dusted. And I wanna thank everyone who has helped me keep Naturalis clean. And all these photos, you've seen people who've helped me for the last five years um, put in their, <laughs> their sweat and their, uh, you know, and their time. And I'm really grateful. So thank you all very much for your attention.